receive confidential prayer. Email your request to prayer at swallowfieldchapel.org or text your request to 876-877-9794. Visiting with us for the first time? Welcome. We invite you to complete the contact card in the link below to connect with us. May God bless you. Thank you for giving cheerfully. Here are a few convenient ways to do so. You may deposit your tithes and offerings in the drop box at the church office at number 7, Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tithes and offerings can also be done by direct online deposit to our Swallowfield Chapel BNS New Kingston current account, account number 804161, the branch number 50575, or click Give on our website at swallowfieldchapel.org. If you're making donations for food care packages, please let us know. Are you interested in facilitating a small group? Apply today by clicking the link below and someone will contact you to help you get started on this great opportunity to disciple others. Training will be provided. Meet up block party Monday, July 24 at number 5 Swallowfield Road. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. Start time 7 p.m. Believers meeting will be on a break for the month of August. We will resume in September. Arise, Swallowfield Chapel's Women's Ministry presents a merry heart, laughter from the word. This Friday, July 28th at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Sisters, this is the last meeting for the season, so come laugh, lift your spirit, and keep those bones healthy. Pickup basketball games take place on Saturday, July 29th at 6.30 p.m. at Jamaica College. This is the Swallowfield Chapel Sports Ministry event. Come out and support the team. Join us for in-person service on Sunday, July 30, 2023 at 9am at number 9. Brother Lenward Kelly will be our speaker. Invite someone to church and bring the entire family. If you're unable to attend, tune in to our YouTube channel and worship with us. For the links to these and other activities, visit swallowfieldchapel.churchcenter.com. May God bless you as we worship together.
Everybody sing this please. Do, 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 do. Let me hear you back really loud. Follow me again and say. Do, 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 do. Hey, shout it louder. Do, 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 do. Let me tell you what it means. Yeah. You should know about a lover like this. Sing it really loud. Say. You should know about a lover like this. We want the world to know today. You should know about a lover like this. Let's go. Oh, you should know about a lover like this. Oh, search for love in all the worst places you'll find. It's too temporary, not enough. So many promised you forever, but it's kind of, kind of alive and it's a blood. No, you're spending so much time in mirrors, think you're lacking. Self esteem is going down. Yes. Welcome to Swallowfield Chapel, and we are so glad you could join us. My name is Kai Wigan. It's Vacation Bible School Week here at Swallowfield Chapel, and you will be hearing more about this in a short while from seven-year-old Lauren Williams. Our speaker for today is Brother Paul Hemmings, and the title of his message is Finish Well. Our mission at Swallowfield Chapel is to be and make disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do this by helping people to connect, grow and serve that simply means we help people to connect to god and to the christian community of faith the church we help people to grow as faithful followers of our lord jesus christ and we empower people to serve wherever god has placed you in the world don't forget to share the link with your family and friends and to subscribe to our youtube channel may god bless you as you worship with us come on let's continue to give the lord some praise Thank you, Jesus. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. These vagabonds. And I tried with all my might, and I just can't wait. 
Greetings, Swallow family. I'm Matthew, the team ministry coordinator here at Swallow Fit. And guess what? Crossroad Camp is only two weeks away. You see, Crossroad Camp is essential to our ministry as we aim to do life with our teens. And I'm seeking partnership from you, my Swallow family. You see, our goal is to reach $1 million to send 65 teens to camp. And this Sunday, we're giving you guys the opportunity to partner with us as we share the gospel to this generation. We're seeking donations of upwards of $10,000 to hit that target, and we need you. We need you. So to donate, you can make a direct deposit to our church account, stating that this is for Crossroad Camp in the details section, or you can come to our church office to make a deposit. Enough love. See you guys on Sunday. My name is Lauren. I stayed at VBS this week. It has been very fun. We do music, art and craft, and sports. My favorite activity is music because you get to learn and sing and dance and learn about God. I also like the Bible studies, and I want to thank the parents, the teachers, the volunteers and everyone 
who made this week happening. I also want to thank my parents for bringing me here because I had so much fun. Woo! Thank you for bringing us all before you today. Thank you for being the God who hears our prayers, who reaches down towards us, who comes close to us when we're in trouble, when we're sick, when we're in need, Lord. I put before you the grieving, Lord. You say that you're a comforter, Lord. Your word says that you're close to the brokenhearted and those who are contrite in spirit. So, Lord, please be close to them. Please walk alongside them in this moment of grieving, I pray that you'll be their comfort and that you'll remind them that this is not the end and that there's more to life. There's an eternal life waiting with you, Lord. I pray for those who are sick in this moment, Lord. I pray that you'll be their healer, that you'll be their Jehovah Rapha. 
that you will just keep them in this moment that whatever they're struggling with whatever their pains are that you'll ease them i pray for healing over them lord i pray that your mighty hand will come down and just give them the healing that they need i also pray for those who are taking care of them i pray that you'll give them the strength to do so i pray that you'll give them the wisdom to do so and i pray that you'll just enable them to do so to the best of their ability Lord, I continue to pray for Jamaica as a whole. I pray that you'll be with our nation's leaders. You'll be with those who made the most important decisions. I pray that you'll give them wisdom, not worldly wisdom, but wisdom straight from you, Lord. In this time of turmoil and just a lot of confusion, I pray that you'll give clarity, that you'll come down upon our leaders and just give them the wisdom that they need. I pray for peace in our nation. I pray against all violence and just, I pray that we'll be able to live together peacefully. Um, we continue to glorify and magnify your name, Lord. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you come close to us. We thank you that you care for us and that you love us so dearly. And we just pray that you'll be with us through every single thing. In your name I pray, amen. The scripture reading is taken from Judges 8, verses 1 to 27. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. But he answered them, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abizer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. He said to the men of Sukkoth, Give my troops some bread and they are worn out, and I am still pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Median. But the officials of Sukkoth said, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your troops? Then Gideon replied, Just for that, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will tear your flesh with the desert thorns and briars. From there, he went up to Peniel and made the same request of them. But they answered as the men of Succoth had. So he said to the men of Peniel, When I return in triumph, I will tear down this towel. Now Zeba and Zamula were in Karkor with a force of about 15,000 men. All that were left of the armies of the eastern peoples, 120,000 swordmen had fallen. Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Noba and Jogbeha and attacked the unsuspecting army. Ziba and Zalmunna, the two kings of Median, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, rooting their entire army. Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Heres. He caught a young man of Sukkoth and questioned him. And the young man wrote down for him the names of the 77 officials of Sukkoth, the leaders of the town. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Sukkoth, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me, saying, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zulma in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Sukkoth a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. Then he asked Ziba and Zalmunna, what kind of men do you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered, each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their life, I will not kill you. Turning to Jethro, his older son, he said, kill them. 
But Jetta did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and was afraid. Ziba and Zolmuna said, Come, do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camels' necks. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an airing from your share of the plunder. It was a custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on the camel's necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshipping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. This is the word of the Lord. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Pray
morning, Swallowfield. Great to be here with you again another Sunday morning. I want to thank Kai for reading the scriptures for us this morning. And of course, this, we are focusing on the life of Gideon. And last week, we had a pastor who, was, who shared on the topic, God can will you. Today, we're continuing to look at the life of Gideon. We're coming down to the close of his life. And I want to call this sermon, give it the title, finish well finish well let's pray father we thank you for your word and we thank you lord for the miracle of preaching the miracle whereby lives are transformed and our will becomes conformed to yours and our personalities become formed and shaped into that of jesus christ our lord lord we pray that as your word goes forth that the holy spirit will take it and do what he will with it so that our lives might honor and please you. Lord, help us to finish well, we pray. Amen. I want to zero in on this verse, this particular verse uh, from the, the chapter. It says in verse 4, Then Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the Jordan and crossed over, weary, yet pursuing. Weary, yet pursuing finish well the most brilliant man who ever lived in the united states of america Sidis william Sidis could read the new york times at 18 months at a3 his father taught him how to read greek the greek alphabet and subsequently he started to read Omer in greek of course by age six or eight thereabout, he had reportedly taught himself and spoke eight different languages fluently, Latin, Greek, French, Russian, German, Hebrew, Turkish, and Armenian. And he even invented his own language, which he called Vendagut. At eight, he passed the MIT entrance exam. And at nine, Harvard's ex uh, entrance exam, but he was judged too young, so he had to wait until he was 11. Sidis earned his Bachelor of Arts degree, cum laude, on June 18, 1914, at age 16, while teaching at Harvard part-time. It is said that his IQ was between 250 to 300. And Einstein, remember Einstein, his IQ was a paltry 200. MIT physics professor Daniel F. Comstock was full of praises for William Sidis. He says, I predict that young Sidis will be a great astronomical mathematician. He will evolve new theory theories and if, if invent new ways of calculating astronomical phenomena. I believe he will be a great mathematician, the leader in that science in the future. But after returning to the East Coast in 1921, Sidis was determined to live an independent and private life. He only took work running adding, adding machines or only, or sorry, or other fairly menial tasks. He worked in New York, New York City and became estranged from his parents. He obsessively collected bus tickets. He wrote some self-published periodicals and taught small circles of interested friends his version of American history. In 1933, Sidis passed a civil service exam in New York, but with a low score of 254. William Sidis, 
died in 1944 at age 46, totally unknown as a minor clerk. Menial duties was what he pursued, and trivia was what he also pursued. He was unknown, and nobody, maybe even you, have ever heard about William Sidis. In other words, William Sidis started off very well, but he did not finish, finish well. We come to the story of Gideon, and Gideon was a man who was very timid, if you can remember. He had a very low self-esteem, and he was a he was a doubter. Gideon was during the time of of the Midianites that was that, that were, was causing great havoc for the children of of Israel. I remember that time in the time of Judges. It was just a a, a very dark time in the time of Judges, and it, there was a cycle that Israel found itself in. So Israel would be in sin, then because of sin they would suffer. And because of this suffering, they would supplicate the throne of God. And then they, when they supplicate the throne of God, then there will be salvation, meaning deliverance. And after deliverance, there'll be shalom. And after shalom, there'll be sin. A whole vicious cycle of tragedy and sin. So the angel comes to Gideon, and Gideon is found threshing wheat in a wine press. And of course, he's hiding from the Midianites, who, when they came through, they would ravish the whole uh, property and land of the Israelites, taking everything, leaving nothing for them. So Gideon was hiding from these Midianites. He was a, a doubter. He was a, a skeptic. He was insecure, fearful, weak, a fleshly man. And this is the man that the angel came to. Last week, Pastor brought us through the first part of the story, just helping us to understand who this Gideon was and how God can take a small person, how God can take a person who doesn't believe in themselves, and God can make a mighty thing out of a very small, a very small thing. But one thing strikes me about chapter 8, that verse that I just read, it says that Gideon and his men, they were weary, but yet they pursued weary yet they pursued of course god called him to this great this great mission and gideon he developed this courage and he was now pursuing the enemy and he was running after them very very hard and even though they were tired and and hungry the scripture says that they kept up the chase they kept pursuing the enemy and I want us to just reflect on what caused this Gideon, this, this small man, this, this insecure man, this man with low self-esteem, to have this kind of an energy to be running after the enemy as he did. And I want to submit to us four reasons why Gideon may have been running after the enemy this, this, this much. And I want to just encourage us today that you may feel weary but as you feel weary, that God has the, the ability, God has the, 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 a way to, to inspire us and to, to cause us to, to live this Christian life, to, to, to be victorious in this Christian walk, even though at times it seems so hard and difficult. But God has a way to inspire us, just like Gideon was inspired. So come with me as we look at the reasons that I came up with about four reasons as to why Gideon was able to pursue the enemy even though he and, and his men were very much tired. The first thing that I see in the whole story of Gideon, chapter 6, 7, and 8, the first thing I see and what I think contributed to, to this zeal, to this, to this energy, that Gideon had was that he reflected on God's past activity and power. God's past activity and also God's power. First of all, remember the story that the, the, the Midianites teamed up with another group of people and the army was about 135,000 soldiers. And Gideon, by this time, where the text says he was weary yet pursued, had between with his men, and miraculously, with his men, they had killed 120,000 soldiers, but with 300 men. 
Remember how the story be began that they, they, they had about uh, 32,000 men and God says, I want you to cut the army. And after they cut the army to about maybe 20,000 men, the, the Lord says, this army is still too big. And he had to cut the army again to 300, 300, 300 men. And these 300 men, by God's power, by God's miracle, was able to take down 120,000 soldiers. And so when Gideon saw this, I believe that it inspired Gideon. I believe that it motivated Gideon to go on when he, see, he saw how God acted in the past, what God could do in the past. Gideon reasoned to himself, that if God can do that, then he can finish the job and do this. In other words, there was about 15,000 more men for Gideon to wipe out and to kill. And so Gideon went on that chase, inspired by what God had already done in the past. Not only did God uh, equip and, and enable uh, Gideon and his army to, to wipe out these 120,000 men, but understand this, that Gideon also saw the fulfillment of God's word. We're told that Gideon, God told Gideon, look, if, if, if you're still doubting, and, and Gideon was just a, a person with very fearful, very timid, he had a very low self-esteem. And you know what I like about God? God worked with Gideon. God, God, God encouraged Gideon. God helped Gideon to, uh, to understand. Listen, I understand where you're coming from. I understand your fears. And so I'm going to work with your fears. Can I just interject and say, God wants to work with your fears. There's some timidity that you have. There's some, there's some uh, reservations that you have, but God wants to work with those reservations because he's that kind of a God. He's a patient and understanding God. So God says to Gideon, listen, go down to the camp. And when you go down to the camp, you're going to overhear them talking about you. And you're going to overhear them talking about how you are going to conquer them. And so said, so done. Gideon with his, with his friend went down to the camp and listened in and they, he recognized Recognize that as God told him, so it was happening. In other words, because of the fulfillment of God's word, Gideon became inspired. In other words, God's past activity and God's power moved Gideon onto the task at hand. Also, Gideon saw where, where God says to him, listen, I'm go you're going to cut the army to 300 because I don't want at the end of the day, the army thinks that it's because of our military might where we're able to, to succeed and able to be victorious over the Midianites. I want to cut it to 300 men. Too many cooks spoil the wrath, God is saying. And so with all of this, Gideon saw how God acted in the past, in the recent past, and that gave him impetus, that gave him energy, that gave him motivation to chase right after the enemy right after the Midianites. The truth is you and I have a, a, a battle that we're fighting. You and I have a Christian war that we're in. We, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of, of darkness and wickedness in high places. That's, that's our battle today. And sometimes we, we recognize that we, we, we become so fearful in our Christian walk, in, just in life, and we think we can't take on certain things. But I, I want us to be able, just like Gideon, to reflect on God's past activity in our lives. And sometimes there are things that, you know, just a physical things that we're, we're grappling with. Maybe it could be an expense that we're grappling with, something in our life that we're grappling with. And we're having doubts like Gideon. We're having fears like Gideon. We're, we're having a sense of low self-esteem. We feel as though we can't go on. But with God's reflection on God's past activity, that can inspire us to do what God wants us to do. The same God who acted in the past can act in the present. Can I add to that? Can act for the future. And we need to trust God's past activity. It is good to always journal, to write down, to make a mental note as to what God has brought us through because we're going to need that for the future, for the, the future battles that we're going to face. You know, Israel had a, a practice as they sojourned and as they, 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 they you know, went, went on their wilderness journey. They had a practice. And this was a practice. Whenever they passed a 
whenever they saw God acting in a particular way, like crossing the Jordan or crossing the Red Sea, you know what they would do? They would set up what, what is called altars. In other words, they would put stones, pack stones on each other. So that, so that whenever they're passing back that way, they can remember what God did for them. Can I just encourage us to set up altars, to set up things in our lives so that we can remember God and remember where he is taking us from. God's past activity and God's power in our lives. The second thing that might have inspired Gideon to, to move on was not just God's past activity and God's power, but God's presence. Somebody say presence. God's presence. Here's what the word of the Lord says. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. That's the first thing that was said to Gideon as the Lord, as the angel of the Lord appeared appeared unto Gideon. The Lord is with you. Not just that. Verse 16 of chapter 6 says, but the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. In other words, friends, if you notice the tense a while ago, one is a present tense and one is a, 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 a future tense, present tense. <laughs> God is right there. He is present with us. But God is not just present with us, but God will be with us. And so he's assuring Gideon of his own presence, that I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. Can you remember who else God said that to? To Joshua, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because if we're going to move, if we're going to move with, with, with alacrity, if we're going to move with God's, with God's power, if we're going to move in God's strength, we mean, it means that we need God's presence. That's very, very important for us to have. So God assured him that he was with him. He said it through his word. He said it through his works, and it said it, he said it to him through his wonders. His word, his works, and his miraculous wonders. God said it to him. And you might be asking the question, and I ask the question, how do we know that God is present with us today? How do we know that God is, how do I know that God is with, with me? How, how can I sense God's presence? It's, a, it's one thing to talk about God's presence, but it's another thing to, to really sense that God is where I am and God is moving where I am today. Now, this sensing of God's presence, first of all, it must be facilitated by the study of his word. In other words, we have to know God. We have to know what God looks like. We have to know what God feels like. We have to know how God operates. We have to know that. And it's just a word that is going to help us with that. And not just that, prayer is another thing that is going to help us with understanding and recognizing the presence of God. God. First, I came up with some things that 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 that, that I find that have helped me and, and 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 help others to know that God is present. First of all, the unsolicited visit of the person, a person of God. In other words, somebody coming to be with you, somebody coming to say something to you about what God has said, somebody coming to, to introduce you to God. Remember when you, before you were a Christian, somebody, somebody came to you. In fact, you had nothing to with, do with God, but somebody came alongside you and they introduced you or spoke to you something about God. And we see this in the life of Gideon. The angel of the Lord came to Gideon. And maybe the angel of the Lord, sometimes when the angel of the Lord comes, he doesn't come in a you know eerie kind of a spiritual way. Sometimes it's a you, it's a human form. So Gideon is seeing this person and he's engaged now in conversation with this, with this, with this person. So when he says, My Lord, it's a come on letter uh, L. And so, and so he's saying, sir, how do I know that God is? So, so God has a way of sending emissaries, of sending people in our lives so that we might know that God there with me. Not just the unsolicited visa, I call it unsolicited because it's not like we want people to come in our lives to tell us about God, especially before we're Christian. We're not, we're not interested in that. But God has a way of sending people our way because he wants to speak to us. He's present. Secondly, I call this the ubiquitous presence of God, not just his unsolicited vis visit, but the ubiquitous presence of God, meaning God is everywhere. God is 
omnipresent. And so as we look at creation, as we look at the sky, we see marks of God. And so the truth is God is present everywhere in our world. God doesn't just show up. Of course, he has a way of showing up, but without showing up, God is always, always there. So I call this a ubiquitous presence of God. Not just that, the unusual occurrences in and around us. God sometimes does some things in and around us that is just quite unusual. And so this is how we know that God is right there, that God is present. He has a, 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 the unusual occurrences in and around us. And not just that, the uncontrollable work of God in my life. But sometimes, Paul means I do something sometimes, and me know it's not me. It must be God. And some have to say, no, God, you're there, you're there, you're there. We're there, we're there. Because I recognize that with this uncontrollable work that is going on in my life or something that I have done, I can't take the credit whatsoever because I know is God working in my life. In other words, the uncontrollable work of God in me in my life and even around me and finally the unique person of the holy spirit the unique person of the holy spirit in other words as believers we are indwelt by the holy spirit and the holy spirit of course uh, uh speaks to our spirit so that we might know we have this assurance that god is in me and god is also with me and god is working through me come again god is in me god is with me and god is working therefore through me and i can the, the holy spirit in me confirms that in my own life so to have this excitement, to have this zeal when we're tired and we, we, we want to keep pursuing, we need God to re reflect on God's past activity and his power. And we need to reflect on God's presence. But thirdly, God's purpose. Somebody said purpose. God's purpose. Hear, what, he, hear how God approaches, the angel of the Lord approaches Gideon. The angel says to Gideon, O valiant warrior. <laughs> Now, that is interesting because Gideon is not a valiant warrior. Gideon is hiding. Gideon has, has given up on life, has given up on, on, on just, you know, given up on Israel. He has given up. So he's hiding in a place that he really, that's not the place for what he wants to do. But he's hiding there. He's hiding there. And so as he hid there and he's, he's threshing out wheat in a wine press, wheat in a wine press, he's not supposed to be there, but he's doing it. The, the angel shows up and says, oh, valiant, valiant warrior. In other words, God gave Gideon purpose. And because he gave Gideon purpose, that inspired Gideon. Now, if you notice what I'm doing, I'm really tracking, tracking backwards, I'm almost like I'm, I'm, re I'm reeling by rewinding the tape. Because I started out by talking about God's past activity, then his presence, now his purpose. It's almost like purpose was where Gideon kind of started. He started with purpose. And God says to him, you're a valiant warrior. In other words, it's what God thinks about you. You know, it, I, this, this, this is ministering to me. You know what ministers to me? It's not so much what Paul Emings think about Paul Emings. It's what God thinks about me. It's not what people think about me. I don't care. It's what God thinks about me. And, and somebody needs to hear that because, because sometimes you, you, people think all oh, sorts of things about you, negative things and so, so the, the gossip is ripe, ripe about you and so on. But it's not what they want to say. It's what God thinks about you. It's not even what you want to think about your own self. It is what God thinks things about you. God says to Gideon, oh, valiant warrior. You're a valiant warrior. Not just that, he says, you, you, you are, I'm calling you to deliver Israel from the hand of the Midianites. The same person, that the same people that you're hiding from and running away from, I am calling you to deliver your people from them. Can you imagine that? In other words, God giving Gideon purpose. And because he has this purpose, it gives him a kind of impetus because he has this newfound uh, um, reason for being, this, 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 this meaning in life now, what it does for him is that it gives him a renewed energy. It gives him a vibe. It gives him a zest. It gives him a zeal. It gives him exuberance because God has given Gideon 
purpose. Can I say something to you? That God has called you to be a deliverer. God has called you to make a difference. God has called you to finish well. He has called you to start something and he wants you to start it and continue it and, and, and conclude it. He has called you to be a deliverer. The truth is, all of us are in deliverance ministry. You know, we think deliverance ministry is something that is reserved for uh, Elder Fredo and team and others, you know, who are, you know, trained in this kind of a thing. And no, but, but deliverance ministry is for every single born again Christian. Yes. Now, some may be more gifted than the other in doing it. But the truth is, if we're called to share the gospel and to evangelize, evangelism is really sharing the gospel. It's really about deliverance. You're, you're taking people out of darkness and putting them in the marvelous light of Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. So God has purpose on your life. The truth is, the truth is, we are all undercover agents. We work covertly wherever god has placed us if it's in the classroom if it's in the hospital if it's in a law firm if it's in corporate wherever god has put us he has put us there as covert operants as undercover agents but you know the truth is some of us do undercover you know but he has placed us there so that we might make a difference wherever he has placed us we are god's emissaries and we operate as so. so god gives us purpose what's your purpose your purpose is not to make money what's your purpose your purpose is not the, to, to just help that organization do well and increase its profits no your purpose is to bring god's glory your purpose is to bring god's dominion over where you are your purpose is to bring back god's reign in the earth god's kingdom may god's kingdom be, uh, come on earth as it is in heaven. What inspired Gideon? What caused him, even though he was weary, scripture says, yet he pursued God's past activity and power, God's presence, God's purpose, but also God's promise. Somebody say promise. God's promise. Gideon recognized that there was unfinished business. So by the time we get to chapter eight, he's now pursuing the, the, the kings uh, of, of, of Midian. He, he's running them down, these two kings, one of Midian and one of the other alliance. He, he's, he's chasing them because he needs to, he needs to get them and these other 15,000 soldiers that were with, with them. Because he what? He remembered God's promise. He was God's promise, verse 16 of chapter 8 says, uh, chapter 7 says, But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, you and you shall defeat Midian as one man. You shall defeat Midian as one man. That's a, a promise that God gave to him. You know, in, in, in chapter 8, he says, God says to him, See, I've given Midian into your, into your hands. In other words, God has given him a promise. And whenever God makes a promise, he keeps that promise. And what Gideon recognized is that he was not fighting for victory, but he was fighting from a position of victory. One more time. He was not fighting for victory, but he was fighting from a position of victory. It was already done. And many things in our lives are already done. God has already stipulated that this is going to go so. But because we have not been pursuing, because we have not been chasing after, we are not seeing them coming to fruition. But God has promised that his will be done. In fact, God has given you some specific and significant uh, pro uh, promises, and, but you have not been following through on them. God, 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 God all promises that indeed that he is, is going to save, save men. So it's, it's about your whole soul and family members. Guess what? God wants to save them. And so you have to believe that this is done, but you have to move out in faith and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God's, 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 God's 
uh, rain is going to come over your, your institution, come over your workplace. But you have to recognize that indeed that God has placed you there to fulfill the promise that he has indeed given. Jesus says, go into all the world. He says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Also, as we go through, you know, go through rough times and suffering and so on, we, we are reminded that indeed, though they might be able to harm and destroy this, oh, this car, 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 carcass, but that the truth is they, the enemy cannot harm what God has deposited inside of us. Can't harm our souls. And so these promises, we have to hold dear to our hearts and use them as a way to inspire us and to move us Unto, unto victory. So Gideon was inspired by God's past activities and power, God's presence, God's purpose, and God's promise. But even with that, I want us to recognize something, that Gideon had some pitfalls. Friends, as we do battle, as we journey through this life, as we do God's work, as we live this Christian uh, life, I want us to recognize that there are pitfalls. And as we pursue, that sometimes we're doing what God calls us to do, but even in doing what God calls us to do, we have to be mindful that there are pitfalls that we can come up, come up on. And that is why I'm encouraging us to finish well. Finish well. Gideon's pitfalls. As we read chapter 8, and Gideon is pursuing uh, the, the enemy and he's, he's going after, after them. And of course, he, he caught up with them. And before he caught up with them, I remember the men of Sukkoth and Peniel, who were, who were his, his quote-unquote relatives, were supposed to help him. And they said, boy, we, we can't help you because we're not sure if you're going to win this battle. And we don't want to take sides and then the Midianites come and oppress us. We, we're not sure who is going to come out victorious in this battle. Whenever you are victorious, then you can come back and check us. Gideon says to them, listen, you know, man, this not going to go like this, you know. You see, when we come back and we win this victory, we are going to deal with you. We're going, we're going to make some whip and we're going, we're going to beat, you know, and, and show you know, what, 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 what is what. And, and so, so said, so done, Gideon gave them a spanking. And after he was victorious and he killed these two kings and killed those 15,000 men and he, he whipped those, his brothers, his relatives, uh, those of Sukkoth and Peniel, the scripture says that the battle came to an end. They, they were victorious over the Midianites. And as they were victorious over the Midianites, the people came to Gideon and says to Gideon, listen, we, we, boy, Gideon, we love you. We, we think you, you're doing, you've done so well. We, we are just impressed. We are amazed at what God was able to do through, to, through you and those 300 men. Why don't you become our king? Why, why don't you become, you become our, our, our Lord? Why don't you become the, the, our, our, our majesty? Why, why, don't you, why don't you rule over us? And Gideon did the right thing. Gideon says, I will not rule over you. Gideon understood that God didn't call him to become king. God called him to win a victory. God called him to be a military person and to, 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 to be a foot soldier for God. And, and so he, was, he stayed in his lane. But even after that, Gideon says to them, all right, all right, all right. We, I know I want to be king, but guess what? I need some of your spoils. I need some of the, the gold that you got from the, the Amalekites. I, I need you to, to give me some of those gold so that, of course, uh, I can, I can make, make something with it. And, and so they said, no problem, no problem. Remember, they respect Gideon. No? And so they were giving him all this, this, um, this jewelry. And as they gave Gideon this gold, this gold jewelry, Gideon made something called an ephod. No, no, an ephod is like a, a vest that the, 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 priest, the priest wore, and the priest wore it so that the priest could, could, could hear from God and of, could, could administer uh, God's, God's, God's justice and God's, God's word to the people and so on. So it was for the priest to wear. So, so Gideon made an ephod. And he made an ephod, I believe, with, with all good intention. He, he made this ephod so that the people could have something to look at. He made this ephod so that the people could, could, could have something to remember God. 
But the ephod became a trap, a snare. In other words, whilst the ephod was made so they could remember God, and maybe it started out that way, after a while, the ephod itself became an idol. In other words, the thing that was supposed to be used to, for you to remember God has now become the God. The thing that was supposed to be a means to an end became the end. The thing that was supposed to be a noble act turned out to be a bad act. And Gideon had great intentions for this. But the scripture says that that ephod became a snare and a trap to Israel and to Gideon and to Gideon's family. Somebody once says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. What's a good intention? Good intention. But you know, through this, what we can learn that we have to be careful that we don't set up our own spirituality. We have to be careful that the thing, the, the good thing that we ask for, that that thing don't become a distraction from God. We have to be careful that we, we know our limits and we know our lane. Gideon was not a priest, but Gideon started to act almost like a priest. It was out of, what, out, of, out of his depth. And, and friends, we have to be very, very careful. Remember, we're talking about finishing well. That sometimes some things that are good and seem spiritual, but over time we become a snare. A snare. A family is a good thing, but your family can become a snare. That is to say that all you're living for now is just your family. And, 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 that's a, and you see, we, we're, we've become so big on family. If you're not careful, we idolize family. And I understand that family is a means to an end. We, we, God wants us to create family so that family can be, be, become the, the, the emissary and the, the, the promulgators of the gospel because we, we teach our wives, teach our children the, the, the word of God so that they can take it out. But sometimes it stops right there. So, and guess what? No, it, all we're interested in now is just to educate our children and for them to get a great career. And that becomes a snare because we have taught our families, or especially our children, the wrong thing, that education is the be-all and the end-all. We also uh, set up our own spirituality in terms of even the word of God. And sometimes people don't operate from the word of God anymore. We operate based on what we, we think God says and our own truth and how we, how, what, we, what we sense God is saying to us when we're not following the word of God any, anymore. And that becomes a, a snare unto us. So even spirituality can become a snare unto us. And sometimes when things, something work for us, we, we think because it worked for us and because I pray at six o'clock in the morning and I'm seeing results, everybody you know, must wake up at six o'clock and pray at six o'clock. Those are snares. So, so prayer itself become an idol. We have to be careful. Pitfalls. And this caused Gideon to kind of mess up a good legacy a little bit. In fact, scripture says he had many wives and many concubines. And by one of these concubines, he had a son called Abimelech, which he, which, whose name means my father is king. And Abimelech became just a great disappointment to him, daddy. Read chapter nine. Big disappointment to him, daddy. Because they said that Abimelech, Abimelech was the, the son of, a, of a, one of the, the Canaanite women, uh, women of, of Shechem. So Gideon messed up this a little bit too. Messed up a little bit. In fact, coming to the end of the chapter, of chapter 8, and also all of chapter 9, you don't hear the name Gideon, you hear the name Jerubbaal. Jerubbaal. Me, what this is saying, the writer is just showing us the, an irony that Jerubbaal was a nickname that Gideon got in chapter 6 because he mashed down Baal, he mashed down him father idol, he, 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 he take brave heart and mashed it down. 
And when he, when he, when he destroyed it and the people of, wanted to kill him, his father said, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Let, let Baal deal with him. Let, let him contend. So the name Jerubal means let Baal contend. In other words, let Baal fight for himself. What you see happening now in later latter part of chapter 8, and that's how we talk about finish well, is that things kind of start get messed up a little bit. And so, and so what it, the, the, the writer uses the name Jeroboam to show us that no, it seems as though Baal was winning. It seems so. Because his son Abimelech invited back Baal worship in Israel. And so now it seems as though what all of what um Gideon did in the past is almost like he come to not come to nothing. But I want to tell you this: there's hope because in Hebrews chapter eleven we are told in Hebrews uh, chapter eleven we are told that the story doesn't end there. And the truth is, friends, all of us we we want our life to count for something. We want our life to come for, just like Gideon wanted his life to come for something. We want our life to come for something. And sometimes life has a way of getting messed up at the end of it. And the story is told of uh, Noble, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize and how it, it came it came about, Alfred Nobel. It says, the creation of the Nobel Prizes came about through a chance event when Nobel's brother died. A newspaper ran a long obituary of Alfred Nobel, not the right person, believing that he was that it was he who had passed away. Thus, Nobel had an opportunity to granted few people to read his obituary. In other words, they wrote the wrong thing, the the the, the, the wrong thing about the the, the wrong uh, person. So he got a chance to read his obituary while he was alive. And guess what he read? It says what he read horrified him. The newspaper described him as a man who had made it possible to kill more people more quickly than anyone else who had ever lived. That's what he was going to be known for. At that moment, Noble, Frank, Alfred Noble, realized two things. That this was how he was going to be remembered and that this was not how he wanted to be remembered. So shortly thereafter, he established the awards. And today, because of his doing, everyone is familiar with the Nobel Prize, while relatively few people know how Nobel made his fortune by building this atomic bomb thing. All of us want to make something of our lives. But the truth is, not all of us has this chance, like Alfred Nobel, to read our own obituary. But I can tell you this. That God is a God that preserves. Hallelujah. He preserves. So when we read Hebrews chapter 11, we read this, verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lands, quenched the, the, the power uh, of fire, it, uh, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, that's probably Gideon for sure, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. In other words, Gideon, when it seemed as though Gideon's life was heading to uh, uh, south, was heading in the doldrums, because, even because of his son, what we read in the, what we call the Hall of Faith, was Gideon's name. Gideon is numbered among the greats. He's numbered among the heroes of faith. And I believe that that, that can be you, that, that even though things are not going the way you want it to go, and you, you, there, there, there are many mistakes that you have made. What I do know is that we serve a God who preserves. We serve a God that protects. We serve a God that snatches. We serve a God that, 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 that keep what we have until, until that, uh, that day that he will return. Paul says, I think it's in Timothy, he says um, that, that he, he's, he's persuaded that he's able to keep, God is able to keep that which I, we have committed unto him against that day. So even when, 
things are not going well. Even when we think we're not finishing well, I thank God, Paul Hemings thank God, that God has a way of bringing me through the finish, the finish line, even when I'm not seemingly making it. In 1992, in the Barcelona Olympics, in the 400 meter semifinals, there's a guy named Derek Redmond. And he was one of the, 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 the favorites to, of course, go through the semifinals to make it to the final. And when he made it through the, fir the, the first 200 meters, he said he heard a pop in his leg. In other words, he pulled a muscle. And as he pulled the muscle, he, he kept trying to run nonetheless. But of course, everybody ran past him. And as they ran past him and run through the tape, he was still trying to, to finish the race because he, he reasoned to himself, I did not come from Britain to come here to Barcelona, Spain, to just pull up my leg and, and not finish the race. And as he hobbled around and as he, he tried to finish the race in agony, agonizing for the pain that he was feeling, there was somebody who ran from the stands and somebody who ran onto the, onto the track. And even though the security was trying to deter this person from coming onto the track, this person was determined to come to, to aid this, this Derek Redman. What it turns out to be was Jim Redman, his father who came and, and helped him to, to hobble across the finish line. And that's just a great reminder that when you and I are not seemingly being, we're not able to finish and to, to finish well, God is there to help us, hallelujah. God is there to take us and to, to bring us through. And, and I just want us to take comfort in that, 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 that God is there. God is not just simply there just wanting us to use our own strength to finish. He wants to give us strength so that we might finish. The word says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us for his own glory and goodness. Friends, finish well. And God is there to, for you to help you to finish well. Remember God's past activity and power. Remember God's presence. Remember God's purpose on your life. And remember God's promise that we still have unfinished business and he has already won the victory. We are fighting from a position of victory. We are not fighting for victory. God bless you. And I pray that you will indeed finish well. And maybe there's somebody who haven't even started because you're not a Christian. I want to encourage you to start the race by inviting Jesus Christ into your life recognizing that you're a sinner in need of a savior and Jesus Christ is that savior. And so you invite him into your heart and say, Jesus, transform my life because there is a race that I want to run and I believe that you will help me to finish this race and finish well. Join us now for a song of worship after which we'll return with the benediction. This is a house of worship And this is a place of praise Where every demon trembles And where we proclaim your name So come alive in the name of Jesus, come alive. In the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles. And we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus, because this is a house of miracles. church to come alive Cause there's resurrection power your blood runs through our veins and your kingdom triumphs over even the coldest grave Jesus. 
receive the blessing now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory to the all wise God be blessing dominion and power both now and forever amen To receive confidential prayer, email your request to prayer at swallowfieldchapel.org or text your request to 876-877-9794. Visiting with us for the first time? Welcome. We invite you to complete the contact card in the link below to connect with us. May God bless you. Thank you for giving cheerfully. Here are a few convenient ways to do so. You may deposit your tithes and offerings in the drop box at the church office at number 7, Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tithes and offerings can also be done by direct online deposit to our Solarfield Chapel BNS New Kingston current account, account number 804161, branch number 50575, or click Give on our website at swallowfieldchapel.org. If you're making donations for food care packages, please let us know. Are you interested in facilitating a small group? 
apply today by clicking the link below and someone will contact you to help you get started on this great opportunity to disciple others. Training will be provided. Meet up block party Monday, July 24 at number 5 Swallowfield Road. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. Start time 7 p.m. Believers meeting will be on a break for the month of August. We will resume in September. Arise, Swallowfield Chapel's Women's Ministry presents a merry heart, laughter from the word. This Friday, July 28 at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Sisters, this is the last meeting for the season, so come laugh, lift your spirit, and keep those bones healthy. Pickup basketball games take place on Saturday, July 29 at 6.30 p.m. at Jamaica College. This is the Swallowfield Chapel Sports Ministry event. Come out and support the team. Join us for in-person service on Sunday, July 30, 2023 at 9 a.m. at number 9. Brother Lenward Kelly will be our speaker. Invite someone to church and bring the entire family. If you're unable to attend, tune in to our YouTube channel and worship with us. For the links to these and other activities, visit swallowfieldschapel.churchcenter.com. May God bless you as we worship together.